otra vez. ¿Otra vez o no empiezo la ponencia? Bueno, ahí va, más o menos. Eh, bueno, nuestra siguiente conferencia es sobre Hacker Space. Le demos un fuerte aplauso a Mitch Adman, por favor. Muchas gracias. So, um, me llamo Mitch Altman. Um, estoy, or soy inventor. Y uh, the rest will be in English, sorry. <laughs> But uh, I'm an inventor, I've uh, been all my life, and I invented a keychain which made me famous. It's a keychain that turns off TVs in public places. It's called TV Be Gone. <laughs> so, I'm also somewhat well known for starting an early hackerspace. Uh, it's in San Francisco, it's named Noise Bridge. And you're all welcome to come there, and I'm going to talk a bit about hackerspaces today. Uh, and I also travel all over the world giving talks and workshops. Um, by the way, this is my real contact information. Please feel free to use it. Uh, I'm totally happy to help any way I can with projects you might have, uh, you know, running a small business. I've learned a lot through my mistakes in running my business for TV Be Gone. Uh, if you want help manufacturing, either here or China or wherever. Uh, if you want help with depression, I even know about that. Uh, I'll talk a bit about that later. Um, but any way I can help, I'm happy to help. Um, yeah, so... One of the huge motivating forces for me in my life as I do all that I do is to help people create communities. Uh, it makes all of our lives so much better when we're part of communities. You know, that's why we're here. If communities weren't important, we could just be at home. If we had internet, we could just watch people doing stuff, cool things, rather than actually being part of it. But we are here because community is important. But for the next many minutes, I'm going to rant at you. Uh, maybe I'll poke at you a bit. Hopefully, I'll give you some cool things to think about. Um, and it's mostly about community, because community is so important. But since I'm way into hackerspaces, I'm also going to talk about hackerspaces, because they're some of the coolest communities around. They're full of geeks, just like us, and uh, they're tons of fun. Let's see if this clicker works. It does. So, um, you know, what do we do in community? We do stuff together. The title of the talk is uh, Hackerspaces, Community, and DIY, because most people have heard of DIY, but it's really D-I-T, do it together. We can do a lot on our own, but we can do so much more in community doing things together. Uh, in community, we can do lots more collectively than we can do on our own. We can do so many different things, DIT or DIY, really. But DIT, we can do it so much better. We can reuse things that otherwise would have been thrown away and maybe even be toxic waste. We can fix things that weren't designed to be fixed, as so many things nowadays are not. But we can fix them. We can also repurpose things for doing what we want to make our projects cooler, even if those things originally weren't intended to make our projects cooler. We can do that. We can also create things out of almost nothing. Electronics, for instance, is just made out of sand. With little particles of sand, we can create amazing things. This is magic. And if you don't know how to do this magic, you can learn. With the help of community, we can all teach and share and learn with each other. We can do all this with DIT. It's way cooler than toxic waste. So, um, oh yeah, and um, you know, buying things from a factory, you know, that has its place, but it's not nearly as cool as doing stuff together and having fun. Buying a thing is okay, but doing stuff together is so much more fulfilling. 
I want to really start the talk by having us all think about community. Let's think about community in each of your lives. I want to ask you to think back in your life to a time in your life when you were part of a community. A community that gave you support. A community that encouraged you to be all of who you are, to heal, to encourage you to grow. A community full of people who cared about you. A place where you felt safe and wonderful. Does anyone here actually have memories of such a community? Not really. One person, two people. You are super lucky, maybe even a few people. You are totally lucky because for most of us, we haven't had that experience. If you have had that experience, you've had so much to go on that the rest of us haven't because there's so precious little community in most of our lives in our modern world. Yet we all need community. We need it. And to see why, let's take a brief look back at the beginning of our species. Unlike Tyrannosaurus rex or tigers, we're not creatures that are strong and with big brawn. That's not how we survived. We survived as a species because we evolved to have big brains, coming together to support each other in community. That's how we survived, by supporting each other. And because we survived, we, have this, we still have this deep inner need for community. Even though it's no longer needed for mere survival, it's still deep within us. It's in our DNA, for real. We need it. We're creatures that need community. We can live without it, but we can't thrive without it. We can't feel like we matter without it. We all want, even the introverts like me, and probably most of us here, we all need to feel part of something bigger than ourselves. Yet, as I said, there really is precious little community in our lives. But we yearn for this and we attempt to find it where we can. Depending on who we are, we may be able to find community in our extended families. Though for many of us, our families aren't very supportive. Kind of sad, but true. And in our modern world, people are very transient. We travel a lot, we move, so we're probably not all in one place anymore. Many of us try to find it in a place of worship, and that might work for some people, but for many of us, the available places don't really resonate with who we are in our modern world. Some of us who go to higher education may find some good community there. Some attempt to take community where it's available at work. Probably not there, though. We often try to feel community to feel part of something bigger than ourselves by watch, all watching the same TV shows at the same time. That hasn't worked so well either. More and more, we're trying to form communities on the internet. Isn't it great that the internet brings us together? The internet is a great tool, but it's not a great place for actual community. You know, and to some extent, all of the above, all those things I mentioned, give us something positive, you know, like internet, schools, TV, work, family, whatever. And for some, these might actually be great sources for community. But most of us are wanting and needing more. We need much more. And also at the beginning of our species, one of the ways we supported each other in community was to create and share and teach really cool tools. Over the eons, we've created lots of many cool tools, allowing us to survive in a sometimes hostile environment. You know, also we create tools to help us improve our lives. But because they helped us survive, we did. And because we survived, 
The need to create stays with us. Even though we no longer need these tools for mere survival, we still have this deep inner need. It's another thing that's really in our DNA. We all need to create in our lives. And fortunately, now, more than ever, there are so many things available for each of our unique curiosities and talents. Let me uh, take a short sidetrack here and get personal for a bit. Although I now live a life I way love living, when I was a geeky little kid, it wasn't cool to be a geek. I was brutally bullied daily, targeted for being an introverted geek, fat, gay, bad at sports. All these things that bullies thought were terrible, evidently. I stayed away from others for fear of being tormented and beaten, which happened daily, often as teachers watched. Are gym teachers as bad here as they are in the US? Yeah, sorry. Uh, parents and teachers really were not much help. Uh, they were really clueless. And for me, life was total depressing hell, for real. So when I got home, I retreated into the magical world of television, my most wonderful technology. I felt part of something while watching TV. But the show always ended, leaving me not only where I was before it started, but worse, since I didn't use the time to do something way more worthwhile in my life. It was mostly an escape, an attempt to avoid myself. And of course, it doesn't work. You can't avoid yourself. You can temporarily put it off, like with these devices, but it doesn't work. It made me more depressed and more fearful only to become more of a target for the bullies at school, only to retreat into TV again when I got home. Yep, I'm a TV addict. And it wasn't the only way I tried to escape myself. As an introverted little geeky kid, I also tried to escape my sad life by focusing on geeky projects. These were actually way cool, and I learned a lot from doing this, but I didn't learn how to deal with other kids. It was totally solo. There was also no community. Other kids in my school, not finding cool, geeky projects to engage in, or anything else seemingly worthwhile, yet all those people still needing community found some sort of community by banding together with other bullies. That was an option for some of them. We really do all need community. And so we find it where we can. And we make choices, even if they're not always for the best, and even if we're not always so conscious of those choices. It's not always for the best, but we do what we can. As adults, it's really important to be aware of this, since we can be easily manipulated through our desires especially our deep inner ones, like the need for community. It can manifest itself in innocuous ways, such as at huge football games. Or you can imagine what it must have been like to be a part of millions of people thrusting out their arms, waving little red books in Tiananmen Square back in the day. Or even further back in the day, thrusting out our arms, chanting in unison with millions of others in Nuremberg in 30s Germany. So anyways, the point is, community is powerful, and we do need it. So let's use this, this deep inner need, let's use this to do something more positive. I propose events like this. Events like the one we're in now, Jalisco. <laughs> this place is awesome, isn't it? Jalisco campus party. I had no idea what to, event, uh, what to expect at this event, but it's been, it's been amazing. Um, you know, here we come together. We learn, we share, we meet each other, and we also play. It's, it's fantastic. As a result, 
Magic happens. You know, what have you learned here? Probably lots of different things, maybe most of it not even expected. What have you shared here? What opportunities have you found? What directions that you are now considering are totally new in your life that'll take you who knows where just because you came here in this community? Maybe you met someone who you'll know for a long, excuse me, for a long time to come. These are just a few of the kinds of things that happen when people come together in community. You know, and let's make the most of this magic while we have it. We have only got another day or two. This event is going to end. The magic doesn't have to end, though. But because this event will end, I also propose another way, another way wonderful form of community, hackerspaces. Hackerspaces are amazing. They don't have to end. The magic doesn't have to end. These communities keep going because people start them and keep them going. How many people here have been to a hackerspace? Wow, a bunch. But that's a lot of people who haven't been to one. But for people who have been to one, you know, you know they're awesome, right? You can do so many cool things there. There are now over 2,000 hackerspaces on the planet and growing fast. And you're welcome at every single one of them. They're all open spaces where you are welcome. Please visit one or visit many. You definitely are welcome. Wherever you live, wherever you go, add to the magic. Benefit from the magic. Keep the magic alive. Hackerspaces, which by the way are also known as many other names, hackers, uh, maker spaces, fab labs, many names, but they all really mean the same thing. They're all places where people of all skill levels, total newbies to total experts and everything in between, come together in a physical place, like here, but they come there to learn and teach and share whatever they think is cool. And they do this in a supportive environment, a supportive community where everyone is encouraged to explore and do what they might love doing. They really are super places, and they're way fun. And they're all unique. They're all unique because the people who started them are all different. They made them to be good for them and their community. They all have their own classes, their own workshops, their own different kinds of presentations, and their own tools for making cool things. And depending on the kind of space, the tools uh, are unique for that space. There's, of course, tech and computers, which most people think of, and fabrication machines. But there's also lots and lots of art and craft. There's also music and food and biology and science and whatever the people there think is cool and whatever it is they might think they might want to love learning and doing. Teaching and sharing all of these things. Yet the tools and what the people do there, those are really just an excuse for people to come together to be part of community. It's the community and not the tools that is the driving force. Myself, I love electronics. I love teaching. I love teaching others how to make cool things with electronics. I love teaching soldering. So I do all these things. And I teach people of all ages and all skill levels. All it takes is an interest. Anyone can learn. It's cheap. It's fun. It brings people together. People love coming together to learn to do something useful and fun. But it really is just an excuse to be in community together. And I love providing that excuse. That excuse is just an excuse, but it's totally fine to be just an excuse. It's a great excuse. Not only isn't it hurting anybody, but it's helping so many in so many cool ways. It's a useful skill. It builds confidence. It gives a sense of accomplishment to make cool things that you can then show off to others. 
And whether or not one uses this particular skill later, the confidence and sense of accomplishment carry on in the rest of all of our lives. The same is true for the many, many other skills and topics and activities that go on at hackerspaces, just like here. And they are all great excuses for people to come together. Another really nice excuse is that people at hackerspaces find opportunities. One way cool thing that we are finding is that when people explore and then do what they love doing, chances are really good that others will love what they do too. And under capitalism, when people love what you do, they will pay you to do it. This is what happened for me. I made the first TV Be Gone universal remote control because I wanted one. For me, I hate television. I hate it. I sat drooling, wasting the hours of my life away in front of a TV for almost half of my life. At one point, I got so sick of it and wanted to live, and I went cold turkey and got rid of all TV in my apartment. And it felt great. I suddenly have time to do so many of the things that I'd only been thinking about in my life. But when TV started popping up all over in public places, I couldn't do anything about them. But as a geek, I did know that I could turn them all off. So I did. It took me, though, a year and a half to make the first one because, as it happens, the off codes for every TV aren't published. But I became obsessed. I got the off code for every TV, and I made the first TV be gone remote control, and I went all over San Francisco, where I live, turning TVs off and enjoying the hell out of it. It really is fun turning TVs off in public places. And as I was doing that, of course, all my, fun, my friends were having fun watching, and of course, they all wanted one. So I made TV Be Gone remote controls for all of them. But it turned out that many of their friends wanted them, most of their friends wanted them, and many of the friends of friends of friends wanted them. And that's when I realized, wow, maybe there's an opportunity here. So I took a gamble and I made as many as I could afford, which was 20,000. I didn't know how long it would make, uh, take to sell all of them, but if I could sell 5,000 of them, I calculated I could not lose money. Well, it took three weeks to sell all 20,000. It was kind of a big hit. That was back in 2004. And it's the only way I've made money since. Over the past 11 years, I've sold over a half a million TV Be Gone remote controls. That's over a half a million people all over the world turning TVs off and enjoying it. Thank you. <laughs> so, I am a happy worker. I make a living with a project that I love. I totally love it. And this is possible because I took the time and the energy to explore and then do what I really loved. And I make enough doing what I love to keep doing what I love. Maybe you can too. You can make a living doing what you love. Maybe. No guarantees, but it's worth a try. You think so? I do. Most people I meet go about entrepreneurship backwards. They start out with this one idea. I want to make money! Um, but how should I make money? Um, I know, I'll start a company! Uh, but but, but what should the company do? Um, well, uh, uh, yeah, I'll make an app. I'll make an app. A lot of people are making apps, and a lot of people make money from apps, right? And so, 
they start making an app. They get help from others. They get money from VCs. The VCs give them terrible advice, which is what VCs do, and they follow that advice. And then they spend all of the money, making the VCs very upset. But the VCs, grudgingly, give them yet another round of funding, enough this time so that the VCs own over 50% of the company, and the VCs take over, making more terrible decisions because what VCs do, they think they're doing what they are doing well, and they do that well, which is making terrible decisions and running the company into the ground. VCs are great at that. And when you complain about their terrible decisions, they fire you. And you're left with nothing. But that's just as well, because you were totally burned out anyhow from working on and stressing out about something you didn't even care all that much about, and the VCs made nothing on what's left of your company anyhow. Sound fun? Well, unfortunately, that is the norm. I recommend not following the norm. Do things in your own way. On the other hand, if you start by exploring and doing what you love doing, then maybe you'll find something you love doing. Maybe you'll find a project that you really love. And if you do that, others may love it too. And if that happens, you have found an opportunity then you can pour your heart and soul into a project that you think is awesome. And along the way, others will probably think so too. And you start a company and get help and maybe grow, maybe. No guarantees, but worth a shot? It's up to you. One thing though is guaranteed. If you don't explore and do what you love, you definitely will not be making a living doing what you love. Let's talk about success. Most people haven't actually thought about what it is. What is it? <laughs> is it a pile of money? A pile of money, well, you can do cool things with money, but it's not about the money. Some say that success is making lots of money, but how much money? What does it take for that pile to be a success. A little pile, a bigger pile, a huge pile, how much is enough? Let's say you start a company and you make 20 million pesos. That's a big pile of money. Is that a success? Is that enough to be called a success? What if you hated doing all you did to make that pile of money? and you spent several years of your life doing almost nothing but making that pile of money. Is that a success? How about another example? You started a company, and after a few years, you actually lost a bunch of money, and you went out of business. Is that a failure? In some senses, probably yes. But what if that company and everything you were doing in it was with a project you totally loved and you were working with people that you really loved working with and you learned tons doing all that you did and you learned so much that can be applied to whatever is next in your life? Can't that be, in many senses, some success as well? It's not about the money. The money is a resource that you can use for other things. If you focus on the money, you're focusing on a resource and not your life, and your life, believe it or not, believe it or not, your life is more important than any pile of money, no matter how big or small. Money is important because we need it in our society, but it's not about the money. What if you find a project you love, and then maybe others love it too. Let's say they do. And you find an opportunity in that and you start a company. You get help from people you really like and, though, and through all the inevitable ups and downs of your company, which is basically the same of your life and life definitely has ups and downs, but you eventually start making a profit. And maybe the profit is just a little bit, but it is a profit and maybe that profit is enough maybe just barely enough, but enough to keep living the life 
you are living, which includes this project and this company that you totally love. That means you are getting enough doing what you love to keep doing what you love. You are making a living doing what you love. Could there possibly be a better definition of success? Well, I don't know what you think, but that's my definition of success. All of this isn't necessarily easy. We're not necessarily trained, and we don't have a lot of experience in doing things this way. And so it's a lot easier to do all these kinds of things with a supportive community. And more and more around the world, everywhere, people are finding that hanging out at hackerspaces, although it's really wonderful and enjoyable, we're also finding that when people explore and then do what they love, other people love it too, and people find opportunities there and are actually making a living with projects that they are really passionate about. Again, we can do a lot on our own, and we can do so much more with support of others. Look at science, continually building upon the work of others in the past and the present. Look at Linux, creating an entire operating system that's one of the most popular ever through a worldwide community of coders. Universities, at their best, are communities of creative, intelligent people sharing what they are passionate about. 3D printers came about mostly at hackerspaces because a worldwide community of diverse people pooled their knowledge and their resources together to do something they all believed and felt was way awesome. These are just a few examples of what people can do in community. But we actually need more. There's seven billion of us now on our planet, and we all need opportunities to be supported by community. And this is where I see hackerspaces, makerspaces, fab labs, whatever you call them, that's where they come in. They are fantastic places for people to come together and explore and do what they love for the sheer joy of doing it. If some make a living from doing this, that's a bonus. But the main thing is finding ways of doing things that one enjoys. Using your time of your life, doing what you think you really like, and hopefully doing what you really like. Surrounded by others doing what they really like, and supporting each other in doing this. And each hackerspace being unique is perfect for those who start the space and keep it going. They're all unique communities. And there are over 2,000 of them listed on hackerspaces.org. Some places in the world, they're not obliterated by little pins. Uh, China right there, that's about to explode because they're going to put a hackerspace in every university and school. Uh, things are growing fast. It's changing the world. And we're doing this together. Uh, hackerspaces.org is a totally free website where anyone can list their hackerspace and, or any kind of space uh, like this, and it provides resources for how to start and how to run a hackerspace. They also have an email list for anyone to uh, post about getting help running or starting a hackerspace. And uh, hackerspaces around the world really do all help each other regardless of how they're organized or what their focuses are. So please, check out your local hackerspace. Wherever you live and wherever you travel, like the one right here in Guadalajara. There's one here called Hacker Garage. They even have one in the other room, this temporary space where they have lots of cool stuff happening. Check it out. You're definitely welcome there. Um, and if there isn't a hackerspace in your hometown, start one. That's the only way hackerspaces start, because people like you start one. Your hometown needs a hackerspace, or two or three. There's a lot of people. A lot of people need these opportunities. So let's make it happen. Before I wrap up, I want to mention something that might be obvious. 
doing what you love is hard work. Community can also be really hard work. And most of us don't have experience in doing what we love or community. So let's start getting that practice. The work we put in can be extremely rewarding. So where does all this lead? I don't know. I'm not good at predicting the future. But I do know that the future is being created, my future is being created by the choices I am making now in my life. Your future, each and every one of you, your future is being made by the choices you make in your life. Collectively, the future of our planet is made by the choices all of us make together. There are many problems facing our species on our planet right now. We can, if we want to, choose to work on some of those problems in some small way or some big way. And we can each do more of what we do in support of communities. There are many ways to form communities. I want to encourage all of you to become part of some community that feels way wonderful for you. And whatever that means. And if you feel you need to or want to, please feel free to form a new community and whatever that means to you. Let's see what we can do together in these communities. Together, we can create communities that work for each of us, that work for humanity and our species and our planet. Then at some point in the future, we can look back upon our communities and feel delighted and honored for having been part of those communities. And better yet, feel fantastic and wonderful for still being part of our communities. The choices you make are creating your future. The, cho the choices all of us are making together are creating our future. The choice is yours, yours and yours alone. So please choose well. Thanks for your time. <clears throat> so I guess if anyone has any comments, questions, Please feel free. So this gets thrown, and this is a mic. This is a mic. Anyone want it? <laughs> I am bad at sports, so if I hit anyone in the head, I'm sorry in advance. <laughs> Here, pass it over. Hi. Um, Hi. I have the question, how can I... How can I create a hacker community? How can you create one? It's actually very simple. It takes a lot of work, but it's way worth it. It takes a lot of time, and it's way worth it. It takes a lot of energy, and it's way worth it. Um, but basically, you tell everyone you know, and don't shut up about it, that you're starting a hacker space. And then you meet every Tuesday. You create a name that you like and that the group likes. You make a website. You get one of the people, and there's always someone who can make it. You make it one of the people to make a logo. You put that logo on your website, and you have a URL. You put the URL on a sticker. You give away stickers to everyone you know and everyone you don't know who even aren't interested because their friends might be interested. And again, you keep talking about it and don't shut up about it. You meet every Tuesday. You continually meet every Tuesday, and eventually, There'll be enough energy so you know what you want, and then you rent a space. That's Thank pretty you. much it. So, and if you need resources, 
hackerspaces.org is there. And you can just also look up how to start or how to create a hackerspace. I wrote an article about it for Make Magazine. There's lots of resources. Email me wherever my contact information is. Uh, uh, Mitch at Cornfield Electronics. And uh, I'll help. And so will a lot of other hackerspace people from around the world. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Pass it over. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. Do you ever get in trouble for turning off TVs with people or companies, or do you get in trouble with the government because of the TV be gone? No. Two reasons. It's not illegal to turn TVs off, <laughs> even if they're not your own. There was a book written in the English language called 1984. Are you familiar with it? It's a dystopian future where everything's controlled, and they had things called telescreens, which this book was written in 1948, before televisions even existed uh, in, in, in the public. And these telescreens are everywhere, and you could not turn them off. Fortunately, our world has not gotten that bad, so you can turn them off, and I recommend it. It's fun. Also, TV Be Gone is stealth, so no one knows it's me when they turn off. Hi. Hey. Can you turn off those TVs? <laughs> Toshiba, let's find out. I'll use the Pro, though, because um, the Pro, did I bring my Pro? I did. <laughs> Some people think that the Pro looks like a phone, but it's not. It's a TV Be Gone that works at 100 meters. So uh, if I push the little button, uh, I don't know. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess the answer is yes. <laughs> and how much time before the TV can be turned on again? Oh, well, it doesn't actually hurt the TVs. Ah, okay. um, if you want to hurt them, just use a brick. <laughs> Not as elegant. It's also illegal. But, uh, yeah, TV Be Gone is better. But it's just a remote control like any other, except um, I got rid of all of those stupid buttons you don't need when you have a TV, like channel up, volume down, and all those things. The only button you need when you have a TV is, of course, the off button. So I only have one button on this, which is the off button. Thank you. You're welcome. Ah. <laughs> <clears throat> Is this working? Uh, it's yes. working. Hi, my, my name is Octavio. I have my friend David right here with me. He's very good at programming and doing this, this boring stuff. But I think he needs to relax a little bit. <laughs> so I, I find very funny these things with the hacker spaces. And I, I really think he needs um, like an advice from you to tell him what's the funny part of all this stuff that you're doing and why is that you're looking so happy right now after <laughs> doing all that work can you do that for me please yeah well I, you know I, I mentioned I was really depressed when I was a little kid I really was the first half of my life was nothing but depression um, and it's a long story but um, you know the choices I made kept me depressed and once I start realizing that the choices that I make um, have a huge effect on my life. I started paying attention to the choices I make and learning from the consequences of them because I wasn't good at making choices. I was terrible at it and I'm still not so great, but I'm good enough that they sometimes sort of lead to a little bit better than things used to be. And uh, over time, I got better at it enough so, you know, uh, I can live a life I really love living. It took years, but it was worth it. The only other choice was to not be alive. And I'm glad I'm alive. So um, we have to take care of ourselves along the way. No matter what you're doing, even if it's something you totally, totally love, you still have to rest. You still need sleep. You still need food. I mean, real food, not Snickers bars. <laughs> Snickers bars are great, but we need other food too with nutrients. And um, 
So we have to take care of ourselves. And if we're with friends in a supportive community, we take care of each other. It's like, hey, dude, <laughs> go home and get some sleep. Um, I hear from other people that sleep is a really good thing. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. What are your talks on the biohacker community and how do you find it similar or dissimilar from the normal hacker spaces? Uh, I'm not sure. So hacker community is part of hacker space. What, what's the, what distinction are you making? The, the biohacker community. Oh, biohacker. Ah, so biohacker community is growing really fast right now. There's uh, one in uh, San Francisco area that started this whole thing along with one in New York City, BioCurious in San Francisco and GenSpace in um, uh, New York City. But now there's lots of them all over the world and they're doing incredibly cool things. Um, they quite often are part of hackerspaces, but more often they're separate spaces because they're working with things that are kind of dangerous and that a lot of people don't understand. So rather than constantly have to reassure people that what they're doing is safe, hopefully it is, um, they just go off in, in their own spaces and they create their own safety standards and they all help each other in creating these safety standards. And they have to constantly reassure governments that they're adhering to safety standards that make sense. So um, there are some differences with the, uh, like what I'll call the, the, like the other hacker spaces, but um, really they're the same thing. They're places with supportive community for people to explore and do what they think is awesome. And they support each other in doing that. And what they think is awesome in these particular spaces is all sorts of bio, whether it's um, working with DNA, whether it's by growing plants, whether it's by um, changing people's body parts, which a lot of people seem to be into. Um, whatever, it's all okay if that's what people are into and they're supporting each other in doing it. Hi. Um, we, we, are, we have three hacker spaces in the three different states, and we want to ask you, how's, uh, when did you realize that you wanted to create noise breach, and how much time did it actually took for you to start noise breach? And we want to ask you, when will you come to visit our hacker spaces? Oh, I'd love to visit. Um, yeah, this is my first time in Mexico since the hackerspace movement started. It's been many years, um, and I'm way overdue for maybe, maybe a workshop tour of Mexico. This shirt, by the way, is um, uh, from my UK tour from many years ago after uh, the, they discovered all those posters by the Nazis. But um, uh, yeah, uh, doing a tour of Mexico could be fun. The history of Noisebridge, very quickly, uh, I went to a huge outdoor hacker conference. Uh, it seemed huge at the time. It was uh, 2,500 people. This is 12,500, which is kind of overwhelming. So many cool people here. But uh, 2,500 people uh, over there, and they had all these amazing things like here, including great talks, including a talk about how to start your own hackerspace. And that's when I realized that if I started a hackerspace in my hometown, then the wonderful magic of the conference didn't have to end. So a friend of mine was there, also from San Francisco, and we had the same inspiration. So when we got home, we started talking about it, and we did everything I outlined to uh, the woman over there. We told all our friends, told them to tell their friends. We got a name, we got a website, we got a logo, we made stickers, we passed them out. We um, kept meeting every Tuesday. We talked about what we wanted out of the space. And there were not many examples to draw from then. So it took about a year before we figured it all out. And um, one thing I didn't mention before, talking about organization and legal structure and what kind of corporation should this be, nonprofit, for profit, what kind of nonprofit? Should it be membership? Should we have a board? What kind of decisions? How do we make? This isn't why we came together. We didn't do it to law hack. We came together so we can hack the planet. And so energy waned and we realized we had to keep the energy high and we did that by having workshops. And having workshops 
is what kept things really alive. So we had lots of workshops, and eventually we had enough of an idea of what we wanted all written down so everyone knew what they were getting into, and we looked for spaces, and within a month we found several places. We decided on one, and it was an awesome space. We needed money, so we put out the word, and within 24 hours we got $12,000 of donations enough to pay the first month, last month, and deposit, and we've never been in debt since, and that was eight years ago. We've been thriving ever since. It's not always easy. Community is sometimes hard, but we work through our problems, and as a result, our community is stronger, and, um, and it's really wonderful. Every time I go home, I'm really amazed at Noisebridge being even more awesome than it was when I left. And by the way, Noisebridge, uh, we decided it to, it to be an um, anarchist space. And by anarchy, I mean people self-organizing to make all the cool things happen. Because if it was ones with leaders, I would have been one of those leaders, and that's way too much work. <laughs> we're done? OK. So we're out of time. Thanks, everyone, for coming. If you have any questions, just find me. I'll be hanging out here for the next couple days. And you have my email address uh, if you caught it from the, uh, the, the, the screen when it had my contact info. So uh, thanks, everyone. <laughs>